Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Global Development, our weekly podcast where we talk about all things global development. There's kind of one headline this week that we will get into. Um, you know, we were talking just a couple of days after the U.S. presidential election, where it appears that we have a second Trump administration, a Republican Senate, and almost certainly a GOP House, although some of the final votes are still being counted. And there are massive implications for the global development community. This is obviously one of the most important stories. To call it seismic is probably an understatement. And uh, our team of reporters all around the world are on it, uh, trying to figure out what the implications are. And I'm joined today by two of them as we try to dive into this complex topic. Ed Voss Salvinger is a senior reporter at DevX. Colin Lynch is a global correspondent at DevX. And we are, we're gonna dive right into this, this conversation. You know, Ed Voss, maybe just to get us started with you, We've had a Trump administration before, and so this is the second time around. And so I've had some people say, well, you know, what's going to be so different? Why is there so much consternation? Give us a sense from your perspective what that is. I've got a few ideas myself, but let's start with you. Yeah, you know, I think I think there could well be some differences. I think there might, you know, I think one of the things that we saw in the first administration was a lot of figuring out what are we going to do? And I think they're coming in with more plans um, and, and more sort of, I think, thought behind what they want to do potentially with some of these institutions. And so I think you might see more action and you, you might see more action on things um, like staffing in the U.S. federal government. So, you know, one of the things we've heard through the Project 2025 plans, but more generally is a sense that there should be fewer civil servants, which they feel are sort of part of this, you the know, deep state deep state um, and and more political appointees. And, and I think we heard that also at uh, DevX World from Max Primerak um, to sort of balance out because there's a feeling that especially within an agency like USAID, there, there are a lot of people with one political bent. And so trying to sort of create some more balance or diversity in that. And, and, and that Max I think- was a, Max was a Trump administration appointee and he, he was one of the co-authors of this project 2025. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll just add one thing before we hear from Colin, which is, uh, you know, I just think the context has changed a lot. You know, 2016, we were in zero interest rates. We had, you know, growing economies around the world. It was relatively less geopolitical contest than there was today, right? It's before the war in Ukraine. So the context is just really different. And we've seen this rightward sweep across most donor countries, and it's leading to more spending on defense leading to, to much more you know, anti-China uh, posturing and moves, including the global development space. You know, you've seen the demographic shifts. So you know, countries are getting older, donor countries are getting older, more money going to pensions and healthcare, much more debt, a lot of it due to COVID. So countries are grappling with huge fiscal imbalances. So the context is just really, really different than the last time Trump was here. And that has led potentially to a situation where you could see significant cuts. You know, last time we had divided government, there were proposals to make significant cuts to foreign aid, but it never actually came to pass because we had continuing resolutions. We kind of couldn't get our act together on a budget deal. And so essentially you saw flat to even slightly increasing foreign aid budgets. Now it's different, right? Now that context has, has really shifted a lot. Uh, yeah, so as you mentioned, there were, there were congressional guardrails, right? So. Um, every year, the the White House would put out a budget with draconian cuts, and you know you had people in the House and Senate, and particularly well, you, you know that you had you know people like Lindsey Graham on the Senate side, of the Appropriations Committee, who backs a lot of the foreign assistance and thinks it's good for American interests. So that will be you know I mean the Congress that's going to be in place now. I mean Lindsey Graham will still be playing a role, um, but the House is much more kind of within. Um, Trump's camp much more receptive to these and has been pushing for pretty draconian cuts into uh, international foreign aid budgets. Um, so I think there's going to be, you know, there are going to be serious cuts. I mean, there will be pushback even within, you know, the Trump sort of orbit to not go too far. I mean, they will want to, they're going to be very focused on maintaining a sort of diplomatic balance of power vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Chinese. And the Chinese has demonstrated an interest in trying to fill any gap that the U.S. is willing to leave behind. And so I think that the U.S., even the Trump administration, will have to kind of look 
pretty carefully at the different institutions. Um, I mean, you know, one institution in particular, UNESCO, um, that, you know, the, the Trump administration, conservatives have never liked the organization, the Trump administration pulled out. Um, but now, you know, uh, you know, people, you know, the, the, this administration will remember that, you know, Xi Jinping, the first UN institution that he visited was UNESCO. Um, he has a lot of interest in that organization and tried to push a Chinese national to lead it. So uh, the Americans are kind of aware of that and will be concerned about the prospect of leaving that space open to the Chinese. So they're going to have to compete with the Chinese, and that's going to require them to do things that maybe ideologically they wouldn't uh, necessarily consider were they not dealing with the Chinese. And I think a lot will come down to what precedents do, you know, what priority does global development and these kinds of issues, you know, fighting with the Chinese over UN agencies, what priority does it take in an administration that might see, you know, Elon Musk get given some sort of an advisor role to cut huge amounts out of the federal budget? You know, global development historically has not fared well in those kinds of circumstances, right? Not that we've seen anything quite like this before, but so you might be right in a narrow way. If there's focus and attention, there might be a decision that says, hey, let's engage more. But you could also end up in a situation where the Congress, where the center of gravity has really shifted, you know, rightward. You've got a MAGA person running the Congress as Speaker and Speaker Mike Johnson. You could see a, a major shift where even the arguments that you make that are persuasive and that might align with their worldview still become second tier to much bigger arguments around, we just got to cut, 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 uh, because we got other priorities that we need to spend on. So that context is going to be really important this time. You know, last time around, one of the things that, uh, is that we saw people appointed into really big roles um, who, in the end, were fairly moderate. You know, they didn't represent sort of the MAGA wing. So, you know, to me, it's sort of, will we get another Mark Green or will we get a Marjorie Taylor Green? <laughs> You know, there's there's a big spectrum of, of possible appointments. That's one of the things we've got to be looking at. Absolutely. I mean, I think that that will, one, be a real signal for where these institutions will go. And I wanted to pick up on one thing you said, because I, I do think um, there will be other priorities. So I think there is a bit of a question of whether some of these institutions fly under the radar for a while. They're not the top priority coming in. So do you see the impacts a bit delayed? I don't know. I think in the first budget, we will certainly see pretty dramatic recommendations for cuts. Um, if Republicans control the House and Senate, I, I think we'll see pretty significant cuts to the USAID budget. Um, you know, we saw recommendations in the last Trump administration of cuts 25 percent to to foreign aid. I, I don't know if it will be that big, but I think you could certainly see double digit cuts. We've seen, you know, proposals in, in Congress by sort of um, by Republicans to eliminate all funding to USAID, right? Like some really uh, drastic we've, things. I don't think things will go that far, but. We, we've already seen cuts, even under the Biden administration, right? I know it's somewhat masked because we've had so many emergency appropriations for humanitarian aid in Ukraine. So it looks like the overall numbers are up, but aren't we seeing already fairly significant cuts to long-term development assistance? It's yeah, so I think it's interesting if you separate out sort of emergency funding and sort of base funding. Um, if you look at the budget um, for the last fiscal year, um, the budget was cut 6%. And that was just like, there had to be negotiations between the House and the Senate. The House wanted to cut much more than that. Um, that's where the number ended up. And so, so yes, like that all those, like we have already seen some cuts. And if you think about inflation and the cost of food, goods, transportation, all these things are increasing um, in many cases, that means the impact of those dollars, um, they just don't stretch as far. And so I think that's an argument you hear from a lot of people about why these cuts are so dangerous. But I think as someone who sits in on some of these, you know, uh, hearings in Congress, and I, I think to Colm's point on on the Republican side in the Senate, you do hear some very full-throated, um, you know, arguments about why this funding is important from a, from a national security perspective. And so I think that leads to another piece of this, which is how 
which is perhaps a policy around development that's more closely tied to national security objectives, a policy that is maybe a bit more transactional. What can you do for me if I'm helping you? And I think that's something we certainly could see in this administration. Agreed. I think even more than a bit more transactional. I mean, if there's any hallmark of the, of the first administration, it was a desire by Trump to be very transactional. Remember the canceling of aid to Central American countries because he didn't like their policies on migration. And I think those are the sorts of things that will be threatened and maybe actually implemented, especially in these first couple of years where he's got a unified Congress and he has them ready to back him, right? I mean, one of the big distinctions I think about Donald Trump is that and this year is that he's won pretty big and there's a sense that he has a real mandate and that the party really is his party now. So it's hard to imagine Speaker Johnson and others inside the Congress really going up against him if it's a priority. Now, as you say, some things might float under the radar, but there's a chance that if he wants to make a deal, whether it's on the World Bank or whether it's with the UN, if he wants to use American leverage to pressure other countries to do something, that he'll have the backing of, of both houses of Congress to, to do that. And that is maybe a difference that we saw from, from the last time around. Yeah, one, one thing I think is that, that, you know, I mean, obviously there are gonna be cuts, but I don't think they're necessarily gonna approach this as like, let's bring the whole house down. I think what they won't wanna do is completely, utterly reshape and reframe the way aid is delivered. As you mentioned, it will be more um, transactional. It'll be more linked to specific national security, uh, economic interest. Um, and it also will be um, an effort to shift, um, you know, kind of the focus away from, you know, what both Democrats, Democrats and Republicans refer to as the aid industrial complex over to local organizations, which in their view is made up uh, largely of faith-based organizations. We saw that in the last administration, both in terms of sort of the ideological push to um, focus a lot on ensuring, you know, limiting the scope of abortion, but also in providing a greater role for uh, faith-based organization in the delivery of aid. So I think that, you know, a lot of a lot of conservatives who are quite critical of USAID, of the UN, they still see the opportunity to do these things in a way that uh, fits their own religious, ideological, political vision. Yeah, and as you say, it's going to be important who gets these roles for that reason, right? So, you know, last time around, Mike Pence was really a proponent of pushing more USAID funding, including PEPFAR funding into faith-based groups. You know, if you have an evangelical leader who ends up running an agency like USAID, that could really change the nature of the way it works. Whereas if you end up with somebody who's a bit more like a Mark Green, who's been around the agency before, you know, who, who's more of a tr traditional American diplomat, you may see a different approach. So a lot is going to depend on appointments. And obviously, that'll be one of the key things that we're tracking here. You know, we've talked about a little bit about the UN, some of the, the risks and threats there. Um, we talked a little bit about UN, US agencies. Maybe just to put a finer point on the US agencies, you know, the Development Finance Corporation was created during the Trump administration. So you would think this is going to be an agency that benefits um, even if we're in an overall cutting environment, it's probably going to be an agency that takes on more responsibility that is somewhat protected from those cuts vis-a-vis, -vis, say, USAID. Does that sound right to you, Yvonne? Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's right. I think it all, if you're also looking at an administration that's leaning into sort of a transactional approach, it is an agency that I think could be used in that way. We saw it used in that way in the last Trump administration. And, and I think another piece of that is it, this is I think in addition to the shift to localization, you're going to see sort of a shift to doing more aid through um, private sector development. Um, you know, maybe less of a focus on humanitarian aid, but more of a focus on sort of the economic development stuff. And so especially if you're talking about countering China, I think DFC could benefit from that. I think there's questions about whether an agency like the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is sort of leaning into this countering China argument as it's looking to expand the pool of countries where it can work, um, whether some of those agencies get a bit of a boost. And I think we've seen a little bit of, of that sort of leaning on them. And I think with the, the problem, DFC- The problem with, uh, for MCC is going to be, can they be transactional? Because MCC, you know, they have this model that they're very attached to. It's the whole reason they exist, where they decide the countries that get funding through indicators. 
You know, yeah. they don't decide it because the secretary of state says, hey, we got to go give money to this country. So can they maintain that sort of model based approach? That but is traditionally, free- Republicans have liked that model, right? Because they think it's like more efficient. And and but but I think you're right. I But I do think that we are seeing in this effort to expand the countries where MCC can work, um, that that is expanding in a way, okay, can they do more lending in the Pacific to counter China in specific countries? Can they do, um, you know, and, but, but I think that's an open question. And maybe, you know, one of the things that's sort of in the holy grail of the MCC is their scorecard. So could you change the way, could you change some hard hurdles in the scorecard around corruption that l- limit which countries can access MCC funding today. I mean, Congress could do yeah. those things, right? They Congress could, or they could not. Add, to to Colm's yeah. earlier point about national security playing a bigger role, they could change the scorecard to say, you know, if there's a national security interest, we can still fund this country, even if they don't meet the other indicators. To carve right? out exemptions, which is kind of what's happened with, with DFC. There are exemptions for sort of projects that, uh, you know, are national security or foreign policy projects, even in somewhat higher income countries. But I yeah, think- Otherwise, it's hard to imagine that the Trump administration is going to love seeing in an era of budget cuts, $800 million a year that they can't touch, you know, that they can't have any political influence over because it just runs by this model. Yeah. That, you know, maybe some Trump administration officials will believe in that model, but it won't be something they can affect unless they create these carve outs, unless they change the indicators. And, and if they don't do all those things, I would have to think MCC is at some risk. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. And then and then you could cut funding there. You could say, well, they're kind of running out of places to work to work there, you know, and I think some of this comes down to also what happens um, in the next few months in Congress. There are actually quite a few development related pieces of legislation that are waiting to be passed, including a reauthorization of the DFC, which would um, expand its mandate, but also change some of the some of the accounting around how it does equity in some of its other products, which would actually mean that they need less appropriated budget to be able to do more. Um, so I think and some of those things around, could feel. Last time around, the DFC was headed by Adam Bowler, who was a yeah. roommate, famously a roommate of Jared Kushner. Um, and, you know, if you end up with somebody like that, that's very close to the Trump administration, very close to the Trump family, very close to the president, they might have the kind of clout necessary to get this reauthorization through, to get the backing of the White House in a way that if you end up with someone who's a little more technocratic, uh, maybe with a great resume, but without that relationship, some of these problems that DFC has had in terms of getting the reauthorization through could be an issue. Of course, I guess it could happen this year too, right? The reauthorization might happen. There's There's a big push to get it to happen this year. And part of that is also because, um, in about a year, the DFC only has about a year more worth of lending it can do. Um, and then it'll hit up to its maximum portfolio cap right now. So one of the things they're trying to do in the reauthorization is to significantly expand that. And I think, you know, the Trump administration, others uh, really look at it as a tool to counter China in a different way. It's not going to be the same size as the Belt and Road, but to have that sort of uh, influence. Yeah, I'm, Colm, I want, I want to get you into this too, but I'm just curious about the multilateral development banks and where they fare, right? And we've just gone through this evolution roadmap, this process of really trying to reform the way the World Bank works. That has been something that other MDBs have taken on too. And a lot of this has been pushed by Janet Yellen and the Biden administration. So, like, you know, will that continue? Will those reforms continue? There's a lot of skepticism about the MDBs within some elements of Trump world. So trying to get a handle on what, what is really going to happen with them. Right. I mean, you have, you know, I mean, where I sit, the last two, three years have been a discussion about, you know, trying to strike some sort of grand bargain between the global South and the global North on reform of the international financial architecture, funding for climate, health, all these other issues. And you would see the Biden administration, um, you know, making certain concessions on that front. They have always wanted, you know, the UN, um, which has broader membership, not to have a particularly uh, prominent role in discussions on these issues. They want to keep the reform in the World Bank, in the IMF. And so what's going to happen to all of that? I mean, this is was the whole focus of the summit for the future. And I, I don't necessarily think that this administration is going to look kindly 
on the notion to making the same kind of concessions that the Biden administration would make um, to, you know, to the World Bank, to the IMF, to the UN. So I think that's going to be, I mean, I think that's going to be an area where, you know, there's been a certain momentum on the part of the Europeans, on the Americans, trying to, you know, make a deal with the backdrop of concerns about um, the diplomatic sort of fallout over Gaza and Ukraine, concerns that this is playing to the advantage of the Russians and the Chinese. And that question of international financial reform has been playing into this sort of broader fight for hearts and minds. So I think, you know, I think that the Trump administration is going to be less inclined to uh, try to, you know, pursue a hearts and minds strategy and, you know, are going to play hardball. So I think it's going to alter the nature of the discussions. I mean, maybe Adva has some sort of more insights into how it's going to play out in Washington, but uh, but I think it's going to it's going to make it a much more difficult negotiation. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I think on a sort of practical level, again, Raj, what you were saying about who's in charge matters, right? Who we see um, at Treasury will really matter, I think, to the fate of these institutions. I, I will caveat this by saying that I do really think like the G20 as an institution has like taken on this MDB reform agenda, including the current Brazilian government. So it will be interesting to see if other countries sort of take up that mantle if the U.S. isn't sort of on the front foot there. I, I think that funding for these institutions could be in question, um, but but it depends. In the last Trump administration, we saw the World Bank get a capital increase, right? Um, and they did I think that, could... I think, working with you know some other European governments with some yeah. real conditions, right? They wanted to see yeah. the IFC dramatically increase funding in conflict-affected states. They had a bunch of conditions and it was an interesting thing about the Trump administration. In some ways, reformers who were kind of below the radar were able to get things done. And this might have been one example of that. Um, and you're right. There was a capital increase for the World Bank, which is not something everybody may may realize. But but I think there's a question about whether, you know, more funding would be forthcoming this time. I do think that in general, there's a posture away from multilateralism. And, and I think if you look at the Project 2025 document, there's this um, well, in, in one hand, it says that the U.S. Treasury has a lot of influence over these agencies and should call for reforms and changes. And then on the other hand, it says that the U.S. should basically withdraw from the World Bank and the IMF and eliminate funding. So it's a little bit unclear, I think, which direction things will go. I think they'll probably continue to engage. I think how much funding and conditionality, I think, will come into play. Um, you know, Ajay Banga, the president of the World Bank has been asked this like quite a few times by reporters in the lead up to the election. And he said, look, like I he he knows Trump. He's known him for a long time. He said he's the type of person who if you explain to him why this is in his benefit, he will understand that. So it's so I think that, you know, you do have leaders at these institutions who are ready to work with the Trump administration and um, sort of understand what this new um, era might might look like, but I do think there I mean, will be I, I, re real questions Ajay of Bongi influence. Does not, yeah, Ajay Bongi does not have much choice, right? His term ends <laughs> June of 2028. He's going to have three and a half years with Donald Trump as president. You know, I, we'll see at that point if he wants to have another term, <laughs> you know, based on how that experience goes. So working together is going to be important. And, you know, last time around, the World Bank had was, was leaned on a lot by the Trump administration and, and ended up finding ways to work, including with Ivanka Trump on a, on a women's economic empowerment initiative, right? So will they find ways to work together in this new environment where it's more of a cost cutting move? Obviously the IDA replenishment is a top priority right now. The Biden administration is gonna be pledging for that, that replenishment. We'll have to see, you know, how does that play out once there's a Republican takeover you know, uh, 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 all branches of government. So, you know, there's and, a lot and we of- we have, you know, if the past is prologue, we actually were in this situation before. President Obama made a pledge to Ida before he left office. And when Trump came in, the administration actually reduced that pledge, not by a lot, but by a little bit. Um, so you could certainly see a situation where something like that happens again. I think you could see um, Congress before agreeing to appropriate that money, wanting some specific- um, sort of requirements or, you know, concessions, especially around, you know, World Bank lending to China could come into play there. But I think that the U.S. will want to, if it's engaging in these institutions, uh, try to make them more 
of an extension of their policy agenda um, and really want to exert control over how money is spent. So I think conditionality will be an important thing to watch. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And it reminds me a little bit, all of this, of what happened with Liz Truss in the UK, where, you know, since Trump was was voted in just a couple of days ago, we saw the bond market, you know, rates have shot up. And there's at least a debate. Nobody really knows. But, you know, is the bond market saying, look, what the Trump administration might do is so risky to America's credit worthiness that we're going to demand much higher interest to buy American bonds? Already, you see that most buying of those bonds are by the U.S. now. It's not so much China and overseas buyers. And we don't know, but you remember famously Liz Truss being compared to uh, a lettuce, right? And, and they, they put that lettuce on camera for, I think it was 13 days. And who's going to last longer? And the lettuce lasted longer than Liz Truss did. And you know, that was all because she said, hey, in the face of a tough fiscal situation, I'm cutting taxes anyway. Um, and one of the top priorities of the Trump administration, it would appear, is going to be corporate tax cuts and, you know, continuing the, the Trump tax cuts that, that are set to expire next year. So, you know, there's a question, like if you, whatever we're talking about now, whatever Trump sources are telling us now, will it survive if there's a real route in the bond market? You know, if there's a revolt in the bond market, then suddenly they have to say, well, actually, we're going to have to make severe cuts to the U.S. budget then what happens, right? So a conditionality on an item replenishment that maybe gets slightly trimmed could look really different depending on the fiscal context that they're facing. Can I jump in? I wanted to mention you guys were talking a bit about um, the importance of personnel in terms of the Trump administration's um, selection, how that'll fall, uh, affect policy. Like in my world, I think this whole question of personnel is going to be really important, will be kind of an illustration of how serious they are about trying to shape the UN. I mean, when Trump came in the first time, they really didn't have people, you know, like I remember Jeff Feldman was the top political aide to the secretary general. He was closely associated with, I mean, he was foreign service, but he was closely associated with the Democrats. Um, they kept him there. Um, they didn't really aggressively push uh, for U.S. candidates for different agencies. And I think that that's likely to change. But also, you know, you have big changes coming up. I mean, you have UNDP is going to have a new um, administrator next year. You're going to have UNHCR, I think, at the end of the year. The secretary general race is going to pick up this year and go through 2026. Um, those are going to be important indicators to see if the Americans have the ability, if Trump has the ability to pick people that can sort of shape the U.S. in, you know, in 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 a, can sort of, you know, shape it in, in its own vision. Right. And so that's going to be I think that's going to be really, really important. Is this and, and if you're right. And, and if we're all right about the transactional nature of this administration, which you know, remains to be seen, but it seems like. This is something we can count on based on you know, what we know about Donald Trump. If that's right, he's not going to likely just continue to be the largest funder of the UN and the largest funder of voluntary contributions to these agencies without more voice in either who gets those appointments to leadership roles or how those right. agencies operate. There's going to be, you know, as Avad mentions with the World Bank, there's going to be conditions, you would think. Yeah, it's like NATO, right? You know, it's like he threatens to cut off all these countries unless they meet their uh, defense, you know, uh, payment sort of obligations on the 2% or whatever that is. Yeah, well, that may maybe it's a good segue to another topic area, which is climate. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this advice. We were talking about the World Bank and the evolution roadmap, because, you know, one of the big changes Ajay Banga made was to say, you know, on a livable planet and add that to the mission of the World Bank. And you know, they're saying they're exceeding their target of 45% of uh, World Bank funding going to climate related projects. And so will that continue? You know, will, will that be the kind of condition that we might see? Obviously, the Green Climate Fund, they're in some trouble here. I mean, we last time around, Trump, you know, refused to make payments to the Green Climate Fund and the Biden administration has been able to get some funding to them. I think the U.S. is still in arrears, but uh, it's pretty clear we're not going to see more of that. Of course, the loss and damage fund was set up um, during this administration. Very unlikely to see a U.S. contribution there. So, you know, there's some real questions. In addition to pulling out of the Paris Accord, which is, you know, very important symbolically. But, you know, what else does it mean for funding around climate where development funding and climate funding have been coming together in a lot of ways? 
I mean, I, I think anything that is climate focused in, within USAID outside of the US government is going to be not a priority for this administration and probably places they'll look to cut. Now, one of the things that we saw last time around is how do you reframe some of these programs? You Because, you, you know, is it a climate agriculture program? Can you just talk about it as an agriculture program? Can you talk about it as conservation? Can you talk about it as the language around how you're defining these programs might change. Um, and, and fundamentally, I do think you'll see cuts around climate. And there are some other areas we can talk about where I think you're just, they are areas where it, it is very clear that a Trump administration, that Republicans in control in the House and the Senate are not going to want U.S. dollars going. Yeah, I don't know if you have any add on that column, but I'd love to just say a word about global health, which is you know, in a similar boat, maybe, right? I mean, the timing couldn't be worse in a lot of ways where you have the replenishments of the global fund and Gavi and the global polio eradication initiative. You got the World Health Organization looking to do their, their investment round. So, you know, this replenishment model, which has been around now a couple of decades and it requires every few years countries to come together and create a real drumbeat and generate political pressure and you know, a country has to host and, and they kind of push other countries to pony up for the replenishment. That model, does it work if the U.S. government is not playing ball? And <laughs> what's going to happen yeah. with these agencies, right, in, in, the, in the, the coming year, in the coming months? Well, it's hard to say, but I mean, the initial signals that, you know, he's appointing Robert Kennedy Jr. as his health czar, um, I was talking about taking fluoride out, fluoride out of the water system, um, you know, pursuing a lot of crazy stuff. He's, you know, he has his, his past as a kind of uh, vaccine skeptic. Um, I mean, that can't bode well. I mean, it's bad enough in the United States. I can't imagine that that bodes well for um, U.S. health policy. So uh, that's going to be, you know, that's going to be interesting how that plays out. On the climate front, you know, it's interesting is like the the Inflation Reduction Act is, is, has benefited a lot of Republican um, constituencies. So, I mean, it's sort of interesting to see whether, you know, does that gradually, slowly start to change, you know, over time? I mean, we obviously know, you know, Trump considers climate change a hoax that he's very negative about. He's going to pull out of the the, the Paris uh, climate agreement. But is there a way to sort of make the case that, you know, this benefits your constituents, right? And do they start making that case to them, either, you know, domestically, or or even internationally? Yeah, don't forget, Elon Musk now has potentially a very important influence in the administration. He's certainly not climate skeptic. And, you know, he's got a lot of business interests that are tied up with climate. So, you know, Trump maybe has a Nixon goes to China kind of opportunity here. And, can actually do some things on these issues because he's got certainly the political support and the mandate to do a lot of things. So right. it's unclear, um, you know, but as you say, this is one of the big question marks is around the Inflation Reduction Act. And, you know, is he is he able to find a way that benefits him politically um, to keep it, you know, or to keep core elements of it or transform it in some way that meets his objectives? Because eliminating it would be a huge blow to the climate and to a lot of these Republican led congressional districts, as you say. And I think would have a lot of opposition in the business community, which I think matters, right? Like there's a lot of American businesses that stand to gain. There's a lot of jobs that could be lost if it's rolled back. So I, th I think those things matter as well. Yeah, yeah, he's learned a bit with Obamacare. So maybe he can live with the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, I, I think maybe one last point for me, unless you guys have others, is just around um, what philanthropy, what, where philanthropy is going to find itself in this new world, you know, obviously the philanthropy is not a monolith. You might have some that see themselves as sort of the resistance and are going to be funding democracy and governance, you know, whether very publicly or under the radar uh, here in the U.S. and all over the world. But, you know, you've got a lot of philanthropies, I think, of the Gates Foundation, where their, their main strategic focus has been using their money to leverage government money. You know, they're, they're the reason Gavi exists. They're the reason the Global Fund exists. And... Now, if you start to see the U.S. and many other European allies pull back in global health funding, it really exposes their strategy. What do they do exactly? And then if these longer term trends toward the U.S. reducing its long term development assistance, you know, if those obtain for a while, 
this is a new era. You know, we've had 20 years of growing aid budgets. If we see now 20 years of flat down development budgets and you know more money going to private sector development or to humanitarian aid instead, does philanthropy sort of step up and fill that gap? And, and does bilateral long-term development aid become more of the purview of you know, a, a large class of American billionaires who are really interested in development topics and have the money to, to spend at the level of government. So, you know, I think it's a really big question. It's not one that's going to be easy to answer. We have to follow it. But to me, that's one to really watch as this administration unfolds. Yeah, it'll yeah, be interesting. I, to see oh, sorry. Go ahead, Edra. You can go ahead, Colin. I'll try. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how uh, tax policy and the tax cuts, which are expected, play into this and whether you know, they incentivize, um, you know, that seems like they'd have, he'd have an in interest in incentivizing much greater role for philanthropists. And, and also, you know, if you see like-minded business leaders like Musk and others finding ways to um, promote uh, that kind of philanthropy in ways that serve, you know, Trump, Trumpian interests, um, you know, that's another area where, you know, you might see some new injection of money. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in on two points. One thing that we didn't talk about specifically in the global health contract context is reproductive health. Um, and, and obviously, you know, one thing that I think Trump will do very early on in the first few days in office is reinstate uh, the Mexico City policy of the global gag rule, um, which will prohibit any funding going to organizations that do or talk about abortion. And what we're likely to see is a dramatic expansion of that policy. Last time he was in office, he made that applicable to all global health programs. Um, people think that it's likely he will expand that to all um, development or foreign aid funding. Um, and that could just have really serious implications on what types of organizations are getting funding. Um, and on the ability of people to access healthcare and other services um, in many of the countries that these programs currently serve. And, and it will create obviously a lot of complications for all the contractors and NGOs that um, are looking to receive this funding and may require some sort of gymnastics. But the other, the other piece of this is that we, we talked, obviously we focused on the US because the election just happened and, and sort of funding cuts, but we're also seeing this in Europe and we're also seeing sort of this transactional nature um, of aid happening in Europe. Vince had a, an interesting story this week um, about, you know, how the EU and its sort of focus on partnerships to serve its own interests has also coincided with a pretty dramatic shift away from poverty eradication and funding in the least developed countries. Um, and it's just a piece worth looking at, like the amount of funding from European donors going to the least developed countries dropped from 52% in 1990 to 19% in 2022. So I think the, you know, US election against the context of some of the broader forces also just brings into sharper contrast some of these conversations on philanthropy, on how does the aid environment change, given the sort of direction that a lot of the biggest donors are going in. Yeah, it's a great point. You know, the German government just today, Thursday, is, uh, well, yesterday, I guess they called a snap election. Um, you know, they're trying to get rid of the fiscal break that um, their finance minister has has held on to because they want to be able to spend more on things like defense and maybe development. Um, the you know, their European leaders are meeting today and Thursday uh, in Bucharest having this conversation because they know that given a new Trump administration and their likely policy around Ukraine, that you know, Europeans may have to step up and start spending a lot more on defense. So, you know, it's going to be a really complex question to see, will the politics shift in the short run so that you end up with some more funding going to aid? Because right now it's mostly been a story of cuts. Um, and at least from my perspective, it doesn't look like the long-term trends allow you to get out of that story very easily. But it's also sort of crazy in a way, because what are the big issues that the world is facing right now? and what's driving migration, what's driving conflict, and the idea that the richest countries in the world would be pulling back from the investments that can help address that right now seems like it's totally out of sync with reality, but it's very in sync with political reality. So I think that's one of the big themes we will be, we will be covering along with who gets the appointments, along with what are the implications for NGOs and philanthropies, 
this is a really seismic move, as I said at this, the outset. Um, it's really kind of the story of the moment and will be for a long time. So I really appreciate having this conversation with, with you, Colin, with you, Ed Bob. Thank you guys for, for being part of this. Thanks to everybody who's listening to This Week in Global Development. Uh, subscribe to the Newswire. If you don't already, you'll get lots more like this um, in the coming days as our team provides coverage from all around the world. Thanks, Raj. Thanks, Raj.